joining the show is the the great Emerson Hart. How are you, man? Doing all right? I'm do I'm doing great, bro. No complaints. It's uh, it's a little hot in Tennessee today, but it's uh, yeah. it's still a sunny day, and I'll take it. So it's better than January. You know, it, it the the summer the summers in Tennessee, Georgia, Mississippi, just the South. It's like you walk out in the walk out. There's a big old cloud of humidity. It's like, ugh. <laughs> yeah, we call it the pea soup. <laughs> oh man, it is. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of time indoors for sure with air conditioning. Mm-hmm. I think of all the things that's going on in the world right now, I think that's the one thing that you would truly see people unite and boycott, and that is if you took away air conditioning. Yeah, man. I, you know, I grew up. Uh, my house is two hundred and one years old this year. It's an old, you know, southern plantation farmhouse, and uh, I often think about what it must have been like. You know, it must have been crazy hot. I mean, just crazy hot. And it's three bricks thick, and you know, and it's built on top of a hill. And the way it's ventilated, I'm sure it it worked fine. And I guess you got used to it. But on a day like today, when it's 92 and it's bright sun. I don't know how they did it. <laughs> I yeah. really don't. Well, I think it's fair to say that our ancestors were quite a bit tougher than us. You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. So how have you been handling uh, COVID? Has it, has it impacted you? I mean, obviously, it's impacted all of us from a business perspective. But how has it impacted you, like, personally? Um, well, uh, you know, we've I've had two, three friends now who've uh, contracted the disease and and, uh, have gotten through it, thank God, and they're fine. Um, But it's it's been very strange. I mean, we're, you know, obviously this is the the longest time I've been home in 23 years because I've been touring, you know, for all of my career with Tonic and and Solo and with Ezra Ray Hart with the other projects that I do. Um, But I think personally it's just been even though I'm a shut-in when I come home off the road, that's not a big change for me. But being a shut-in for this long has been a huge change for me. Thank God we've yeah. got, you know, we're on almost six acres, so I can walk around. We've got a creek and, you know, stuff like that. And it's been great spending time with my daughter. And, uh, you know, we're pregnant right now. We have a baby boy due in August. So I look at it Aww. this way. It's like I wouldn't have been able to enjoy that, you know. I've been yeah. actually been able to be home and enjoy it. Yeah, you you know, family. That is one thing. Like, I'm I'm home for dinner, you know, and I've almost never been home for dinner, you know, because I travel a lot too, and mm-hmm. um, you know. But it's you know, the kids. Um, how old's your daughter? She's twelve. So she probably can understand it a little bit better than you know a lot of kids, because that's at that age where they understand the world some. But still, at twelve years old, man, you want to be at school playing with your friends and hanging out, you know. It's true, and I and to be honest, I don't think uh, we just moved back to phase two here, and uh, just because people weren't paying attention, they weren't wearing masks, and they were down on Broadway and the honky tonks, and you know having a good time and mm-hmm. just not being smart. So now we're. I mean, I, I really believe that. Uh, I don't think she's going to be going back to school this fall. I mean, it's going to be distance learning because we yeah. start school here starts in August. So. Wow. Well. Well, let's not, if we go down this road too much, we'll both get depressed and, uh, you know, forget about the whiskey <laughs> part, you know, so, yeah. so let's, uh, let, let's drink a little whiskey. Now I'm going to, I'm going to show you, uh, the bottles that I had sent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It looks like the, the lights are real bright on them, but we sent, uh, I sent you, um, the wild turkey bottle to bond. That's a contender for my mm-hmm. whiskey of the year. Old Fitzgerald Bottle and Bond, which is a really nice uh, uh, weeded bourbon. Uh, Mm -hmm. A Peerless that won my uh, best craft whiskey uh, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And then a uh, Kentucky Al, which is incredibly, uh, you know, incredibly complicated. One of the, it's their first batch, but definitely they're one of their best ever. And and so we we have a really nice lineup here. Mm-hmm. for a whiskey fan and i understand that you're a whiskey fan so i wanted to send you something you know send you some fun stuff that we could explore together and and, and talk about and i'd actually i'd actually like to start with 
the peerless. Now, for those okay. who kind of like taste, you know, professionally, would say, you know, that's a that's a bad one to start with because it's 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 so different and it's a it's mm -hmm. a higher proof than the most that's up there. But I want to start with this because I kind of want to like talk about this, uh, you know, the kind of like a new age of whiskey. You have a lot of these new small distillers coming into the game and this is uh one of them this is started mm -hmm. by a gentleman by the name of corky taylor and his son they've got a young master distiller there and um they're doing it right they didn't source they're they're making all their own liquid it is some good stuff so let's start there okay you can see that where, got they, a bottle where are they too, that, where are they located oh they're you know they're uh they're downtown louisville uh, okay. On the west side, right, right up against the uh, Ohio River. Mm. That in my so, how do you how do you normally taste whiskey? What's your what's your normal process? Um, like you said, I don't. I wouldn't usually. I, I do have water. Um, I wouldn't start. I probably wouldn't have started there, but. I'm excited to start here because that, that's a big boy already. I can smell it. I used to take a little mm -hmm. bit of the uh, bourbon. I rub it in my palm and I like to cup it so I can smell oh. all that, that mash. You like the, you like this, you know, play around with it. The old Freddie Johnson yeah. style smell. Yeah, yeah, I dig that. I, I, dig I like that. a little bit of it. A, a buddy of mine who, when I was kind of studying and learning about tequilas kind of showed that to me. I was like, well, I wonder if that would work with whiskeys. And uh, I had remembered that I was, uh, Tonic was playing at the Jim Beam Distillery. This is when Booker was still alive. Oh, wow. And uh, Mr. No, and I saw him do that. And I had not remembered that when my buddy was showing it to me. And I remember Booker sat on the porch and we tried some different whiskeys. And a very large man, as you know, he was. Yeah. Um, but, so I don't know, I kind of like to do that. I, I don't do that with wine, obviously, but, but with whiskeys and hard spirits, I do like to do it. Ooh, man, that is 109 Good. proof, um, Holy cow. straight That's rods, four grade. years old. Surgery, <laughs> <laughs> man. So when you're when you're on tour, do you drink a little whiskey before you get on stage? Yes, I do, and I drink it neat. I do like to drink it neat. Um, so and a lot of people, a lot of people say that whiskey will dry out the voice or it will clear the voice. So I find that you know there's there's two sides here. Where where do you stand? I, I, since you're having it on before you go on stage, I imagine it helps you. Yeah, uh, alcohol is you know obviously is a it's a dehydrator. I know that color's crazy. Um, yeah. Definitely a dehydrator. But the thing is, is you should be hydrating all day. So really, when you mm. when, when you drink, uh, you know, have a, a few tops of whiskey, a few fingers of it before you go on, it, that any kind of dehydration won't show up for like an hour and a half. It's just not how our bodies work. You know, if you're hydrated mm. already, it's fine. And then afterwards, I'll have it with a little bit of soda, just like some old. Uh, I do like Irish whiskeys in the evening, um, Middletons and and you know Jamos. Oh, Middletons, that's where it's at. A little red mm -hmm. breast too. You like? Are you a red breast fan? I am. I am. I had a. I just finished a bottle of '97 Middleton that I brought back many years ago when I, we were touring in Europe, and uh, it was. I was very sad to see it leave my kitchen. Yeah. Oof. They have some great whiskeys coming out of there. Okay, so this is a really young whiskey. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's four years old. But there's um, there's like an oiliness to it. Man, that alcohol really makes some legs on that, huh? <laughs> Is it? Mm. It's really forward with the with the mash. Do you are you getting it, like a real strong note of that? Yeah, you can, like, I get a, so this is a rye, and I, I get a big old piece of rye toast, mm -hmm. you know, so it's graduated a little bit from, like, the raw, like, the raw grains mm -hmm. to a little bit more of a toast for me. Um, 
but this is one to me also it's got it's got some really nice really nice spices to it and I like the way it feels it's kind of oily on my palate there's mm -hmm. like um, there's a lot of um, I, I, I would say like like kind of like a molasses undertone of like a like an oil structure if you will mm -hmm. so it's I've definitely coat i kind of it coats the tongue there's no doubt about it it's yeah. a heavy it's a heavy coat it also has a little bit of a and it's it might just be my crazy pal but i i taste the it's like almost like a clove it has a little bit of a clovey taste oh, yeah. to it look at you man you gotta you like you know, bringing it. <laughs> I mean, it's it's good with. I don't know about bringing. I could be totally wrong, but that's what I taste. No, that's just it. Is like everybody everybody smells and tastes differently. But you know what I perceive to be like, um, you know, a spice. Uh, you know, definitely could be clove. Um, you know, so I think that's I think that's beautiful. So, so you've this been, is a uh, young company. You're you're, you you're like uh, you have such like an incredible like you know story in music and that you have seen you have you have seen like the change in the music industry like 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 so much from from uh you know the 90s the early 2000s to, to whatever we are today um you know what what's that in, in your career what what are some of the things that have stood out in terms of like the massive change we've seen in, in the music business um, obviously, the birth of the streaming technology has completely changed the landscape of our business. Um, you know, we we were among very few of the bands that were still able to sell millions of records. You know, that just doesn't, unless you're a top, 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 that doesn't happen anymore. Um, that's been an interesting change, and I know everybody, uh, you know, has been really mad about it, but I think... Look, it's just, it's another way to listen to music. And once they get, you know, the NSAI, the Songwriters Association has been really, you know, we passed some important legislation this past year about streaming royalties and how they should be paid. Um, you know, because we're still getting paid like it's 1909. It's from sheet music. It's, it's insanity, you know. Mm -hmm. So you have companies like uh, Amazon and other big boys that want to not, they want to sue, you know, they're trying to bring all the lobbyists in and, and knock that law down because they don't want, they don't they don't feel like you know they should be paying that kind of money, which is joke money, really. At the end of the day, so I think um, I think it's been it's been good, and I think uh, barring a pandemic that we're in right now, uh, you know, live music is alive and well, you know, and still great. And I just uh, I always the younger artists that I work with, I always try to instill in them that. That's important. Like you have to be able to use your instrument. You have to be able to play. You have to be able to put on a show. You are you you also are an entertainer. You know, that's what yeah. you do. And your your stuff has been like licensed so much for like movies and commercials. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you've got like this. Um, you know, you, you, your stuff lives in, lives forever in like fifteen second bits and and, and various <laughs> movies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's do, true. Do you have a favorite movie? Do you have a favorite movie that or a commercial that your stuff's been mm. used in? Uh, I would probably say. Man, I thought being involved in you know American Pie that first one, that being the theme song kind of for the movie and shooting the video for it and having all the actors and I that that's always great. I, I love yeah. that. You know, and all there was a ton of other '90s, you know, early 2000s movies and stuff that we. We've been licensed and, and had uh, had my songs in, but but really that I think that was the coolest, you know, just because it's like, well, American it's Pie so cool. represented it represented our generation, you know, mm -hmm. of it it was our um, it was in a sense it was our Animal House of uh, yes, you know, no doubt it was I don't think it was as funny as Animal House, but it was pretty darn close. Yeah, there's not much funny as Animal House though. <laughs> that, was, that stuff was funny. Yeah. So let's go to the Kentucky Al. This is a this is a straight rye as well. Okay. It's in that same proof point. It's 110 proof, uh, but this is 11 years old, so it's got some age to it. Mm -hmm. 
And Emerson, this is, um, I think when this came out, I scored it a 96. This, you know, so this came out in 2017. Mm -hmm. And that, that's all I have left of it. So wow. I'm sharing some of my last drops with you. Well, buddy, you know what? You are very, very kind. Well, when uh, when uh, when Maddie and Clay were, were connected with me, there's like, he, you know, Emerson's a whiskey fan. He would mm -hmm. love to come on. Let's make this happen. I was like, all right, yeah. what can I send him, you know, that he'd appreciate? So I, I, I'm not a guy that sends things that are hyped up or if you will. Although mm -hmm. Kentucky Owl had, had its moment in the hype, so don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But this was this was truly a great a great whiskey when it came out. Oh man, that smells beautiful. It's like a big caramel punch. Mm. To me, it, there's like a spice rack there. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going like him like my in my grandma's kitchen and opening up that spice rack and just smelling that wood mm -hmm. and all those notes mm. and i'm drinking this for my bourbon and beyond plastic like karen which i'm a co-creator in it's our those are beautiful fest, one of our music festivals in louisville thank you mm. and um we had foo fighters last year Stevie Nicks uh, opened it, you know, in 2017. I'm pretty sure Tonic would have been a good, would have been a good band. That would have been a good band. Mm-hmm. Well, there's, there you go. This will be over soon. I hope. Well, not soon enough, but man, right. this is really, this is a beautiful whiskey. It is such a different whiskey than the other. Mm-hmm. They're, and they're both Kentucky Rye's. Yeah. One's an example of a of a craft distilled column. You know, and this one also is a column, but it's got you know it's got a lot of years on it. Just shows mm -hmm. you that time in the barrel. Every year counts, you know. Yeah, it's fucking gorgeous. Beautiful color. That is real spicy. Mm. But grown up. It's a real grown up whiskey. It's uh it's a hard to come by one too. You know, <laughs> yeah, never mind. There's not many I, of these left. That's lo last little bit I got. <laughs> you are kind to so, share, my friend. Well, you know, it's it's great to have you on because you know, we've never met, but I've listened to your music for forever and I feel like I feel like I know you through your songs. You know, mm -hmm. and you can't say that about everybody, you know, who's in music. But I feel like your music does kind of show your personality a little bit. I, I, am I wrong there? Is, is that your intent? No, I mean, look, <clears throat> you know, I, I think when I started writing when I was really young and I never wanted to be somebody else. I didn't want to, you know, I always just wrote what I know. So that's what I do. I, whatever I'm going on in my life or what's happening. Uh, you know, I just try to be as honest as possible as I can with the music as it comes out. It's not always good. It's not always right. Um, it, and sometimes it's not, you know, it's not okay to be in a relationship with me because I don't hold punches. You know, I just, I put it out there. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I think if I have found in my career that if I'm honest in my songwriting, other people are going through the same thing. Yeah. You know, whether it's solo records or tonic songs, other people identify with it. And there's a I was talking to a buddy of mine the other night he's a very very big songwriter his name's David Hodges he started Evanescence and has written 80, 89 million records pretty much is what he sold with all the hits he's had with different bands but I said the power of music that is so fantastic to me is that we can be playing a show in Germany and there can be a 28 year old kid in the front row and he's singing back the lyrics to me that I've written that was a thought in my head 20 years ago. But he owns that. It's in his head. It is part of his dialogue. That song was part of his life. But it was just a thought. And I'll never see that guy again, probably. I didn't meet him. 
but my thought is inside of his head and he's singing it back to me. That is the power of music. That, that's what I love. I, I think that is so, and it's not even about the power of it, it's just about the magic of it. I mean, we are yeah. so musical as, as humans, not to go down a hippy dippy road, but I, I just love it. Just love it. Yeah, and you know, I miss music. I miss, I miss, I miss being in that row or back by the sound stage. Mm -hmm. I think my least favorite place to actually watch a concert is backstage because you don't really get you don't really get a nah. good. I mean, I don't like backstage. I like the sound the sound area, but uh, I, I miss even just like a like a random dive bar acoustic guitarist. You know, I miss it, mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. and we need it. We need music back, and you know, you're you're starting to see some some musicians come out and start to play at a great risk and they're they're getting crucified you know so oh i know and now you know i don't know if this is public knowledge or not but I, I know that a lot of let's just call them big promoter venues and companies uh they're wanting artists to carry their own insurance it's like come on man <laughs> that's not fire <laughs> like we've made you fortunes you can't do that that's not okay Seriously, so, they're they're trying yeah they're they're trying to say like you guys are coming to play at my venue, but you have to have your own insurance. Yes, and wow. that, that's just that's starting it off on the wrong foot. And I, I think I, I, I highly doubt something like that will go through. I mean, if you're a band at like a U2 size or Coldplay size, or you know, sure you can afford that. But for you know, for a band that does a couple thousand a night in tickets, like that, that's a lot, man. It's a lot to mm -hmm. carry. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for sharing this. This is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I might, I might, uh, if I can get my hands on another bottle, I'll send you some more. Yeah, the hunt begins. Mm. Mm. Just fantastic. That's gonna be hard so to now. Beat, my man. We're gonna move on. We're gonna move on from from rye whiskey to bottled and bond bourbon. Now, Bottle in the Bond was our country's very first Consumer Protection Legislation Act. Mm -hmm. It was passed in 1897, signed by Grover Cleveland. It essentially means that the whiskey has to be at least four years old, 100 proof, and distilled at one distillery in one distilling season. But what was happening in that time in the 1800s is you had all of these um, all these people from from the wholesalers and rectifier side who are taking barrels of whiskey and adding things like prune juice and tobacco spit and acid and they were you know putting it out on the market and at that time doctors and druggists would actually give whiskey to sick patients and they would the people wouldn't get better now was it because the whiskey was you know tainted who can say but that mm -hmm. was their claim, like, well, I, you know, I had bad whiskey, so of course he got, he kept being sick. So the the distillers and druggists and doctors all lobbied Congress for this for this act. So now, and it still remains on bottles today. So anytime you see that that uh, bottled and bond uh, label, mm -hmm. you have you have a guarantee um, of basically it's it's purity. And um, and so this this is uh, anytime you taste bottle and bond, it is a taste of history. Now bottle and bond kind of went extinct a little bit because it's more expensive to produce. You can't blend mm -hmm. in stuff from previous years. You have to just stick stick to that distilling season. And um, and so there's not a lot on the market. These are a couple of limited edition ones. This is the old Fitzgerald uh, bottled in the fall of uh, 2018. Distilled in uh, 2009. Which I was oh, thinking man. thinking about this. 2009 was a pretty good year for you, wasn't it? It was. It was. I've had some up ones and some down ones, but nine ranks in there pretty good. Yeah. I had uh, come off of that solo record, Cigarettes and Gasoline. I had two top 15s or one top 10 and then one top 15 off of that. So there were a good couple years after that. I mean, my life fell apart, but you know, I got a divorce and all the rest of that. But other than that, it was, it was a great year. <laughs> great year. Um, well, you know, 
I, I think that's that's the part of like you know people don't people don't always see the personal side that you all you know that you all face because it is tough being on the road and there's a lot mm -hmm. of demands on you as a musician and I know it's hard. It is, but you know you uh, you sign on to make art for a living. Don't cry about it. I drink whiskey for a living. Yeah, brother. That's my, exactly. That's <laughs> that's my talent. You you could. You can play. I, I, I drink. <laughs> I'm gonna put a little bit of this in here. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the Emerson Hart technique here, folks. Oh yeah. Mmm. Smells like cool. uh, smells like my sheets after a night in Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're a trip, man. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you, uh, you know, do you know the history behind the word fits? Do you know this history? I can explain it to you if you don't. Uh, the word fits or Fitzgerald? Well, uh, fit fits. Any anytime you see fits in a name, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it means not not of the pure line. That's what any, that's how they would name bastards. Fitzsimmons, Fitzhugh, Fitzpatrick, all not of, all, not sired from the pure line, but from a mistress. Wow. Mm-hmm, interesting. I like that. That's really clean. Mm. It's a little unfair coming off that other one. Yeah. This one. Still really big though. But it's just, it's it. Even though I know what, uh, it's probably not fair, like you said, but it does. This one feels cleaner and softer. It's just like a softer whiskey. And I know the proof is different, right? Because we came from a hundred. Yeah, it's a hundred proof. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's not. I mean, it's that's not a huge proof. It's not a huge drop, mm -hmm. but mm. Do you get vanilla on the top of that? A little yeah, bit? This, no? is a, this is pretty well a vanilla bomb. Yeah. It's, um, I, I get, I get vanilla. I get like uh, Cracker Jacks. Mm. Um, I get, um, a lot of like, um, kettle corn, you know, so that's kind of Cracker Jacky. I loved Cracker Jacks when I was a kid. Man, I used to yeah. just sit there in the movie theater, pound back, and just hope I was going to get that peanut. Like, I just loved that peanut. That was my favorite part of the experience, getting that little crunchy caramel. You peanut. know, I love I, I love Cracker Jacks. I'd have them after, I'd have them at the, at the baseball game. I grew up in mm -hmm. Oklahoma City, and we had this team, the 80, uh, Oklahoma City 89ers, which is named after the, the people who he basically founded Oklahoma as we know it in 1889. And um, one time I had a, like a little a little popcorn kernel got stuck mm. in my Under gums, the gum? and it oh, yeah. and it's and it took me like like a like a week to get that damn thing out of there. <laughs> so you know, I mean, so I can't I can't think of Cracker Jacks without my the right side of my upper gum mm -hmm. going like, hey motherfucker, don't be eating that shit again, you know. But uh, they are good. Oh man, I love it. But this so what, is what's a really... some other like 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 uh, junk food? What kind of junk food do you like? Because I find that there's a lot of junk food notes in whiskey. Yeah, uh, I'm a you know I'm obviously I, I love the the kettle corns of any kind. Um, I'm a classic. Every time I change planes in Chicago, I'm getting you know the 
cheddar cheese and caramel combo of popcorn. Uh, nuts on Clark. And um, I love really, really thick crusted pizza. Oh, I don't yeah. ever get... I don't ever get pizza from whiskey, but um, I do tend to eat quite a bit of pizza after whiskey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, do, that's, do you have a favorite delivery uh, pizza company? Right now, I'm living in the in the Jets world because I like their deep dish that they make, and it's really just, so it's does so my easy. wife. Yeah, that's kind my of my zone orders. right now. Yeah, Jets is uh, killing it. It is, man. And I'll tell you, and then just to try to be on the healthy tip of it. Uh, their cauliflower, which my wife really was trying to sell me on, because she'll, she'll make a cauliflower crusted pizza, and it's delicious mm-hmm. when she makes it. She was like, well, Jets has one now. We should just order it just to see if you like it. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. This is like a dangerous road, and you're asking me to do something I don't want to do. And so we did it, and I got to say, it was pretty darn good. It's pretty good. That's awesome. Yeah, but I'll take well, the easy deep dish. Yeah, I... Um... I'm a big fan of uh, of like New York style, you know, Sicilian. I like the mm-hmm. Detroit style of pizza. But, you know, occasionally you will get a pizza note, but it'll be kind of like that burnt edge of, uh, uh, of pizza dough. Uh, mm-hmm. You might get like a tomato sauce note in, um, in a whiskey, although I think that's more prevalent in mezcal than in whiskey. Um, Without a doubt, I do drink a lot of mezcal as well. I just got, actually got two. My wife found two great little boutique uh, companies, um, and there is always just a little bit of that burnt rubber that's always kind of yeah. on the front end of it. You know, just like when you drink a great Sav Blanc out of Chile, it's got that mm-hmm. cat, like strong cat odor, um, almost like a cat litter. And that, of course, the the good cat odor is what gets us all to drinking. So, exactly. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know who started a mezcal? Uh, Alex Ebert from uh, Edward Sharp. I heard this. He started one. Yeah. Have you yeah, tried it yet? Uh, uh, he sent me he sent me a couple bottles, but mm-hmm. I have not yet tried it. But uh, he he's been on the um, he's been on the activist train here lately. So I think busy. He's, he he's been busy. It's mm-hmm. uh, but uh, he's a he's an interesting cat. I don't know if you've ever ever played with Edward Sharp, but I have never played with him, never played with him. But I've I've heard uh, many a f- actual hilarious stories about him. So, so, uh, so I had him uh, on the show once, and this was back when he could be in a room, and it was in my trailer, mm-hmm. and you know on the set. And he's like, oh, I can't drink whiskey. You know, whiskey's, you know, it hurts my stomach. And so I was going through my bar, which I had a, you know, it, it was away from my office. So I only had like 50 bottles, but I mm-hmm. knew I would have people that wouldn't like whiskey. So I brought some other things. I brought like a grappa, some gin, uh, some tequilas, some mezcal. And I was like, hey, let's try some grappa. And uh, grappa is uh, was a distilled oh. spirit made out of Italy. Oh, yeah. And uh, he loved it took the whole bottle with him and then i later heard from people that he was on he was going into his hotel room uh in louisville with 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 the grappa so uh went big win (laughs) yeah you got to be careful with grappa man that is some really strong stuff if you it's strong and i think there's like another element to it you know yeah and because it's really just it's it's grape skin isn't it i mean at the end of the day it's it's really what it is and, still uh, grape skin, that's right. Yeah, and it's uh, when I, I lived in France for about a year and uh, in the Burgundy region, which kind of how I started. Uh, I fell in love with wine when I was eighteen. Uh, was living there, but there was a girl that I was dating at the time who was obsessed with grappa, and she would. Uh, she was Greek. I know it's probably it's an Italian spirit, but it, but she mm-hmm. the Greeks claim it as theirs, and. Uh, Man, some of that stuff was so strong. Even on an 18-year-old liver, it would put me down. I mean, just yeah. put me down. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's like wormwood. It, it's that weird other thing. You don't know what's going on with absinthe, you know. You know, they have this... Um, 
you know, there, there's no studies out there that say like certain alcohols affect you differently. But I know that when I drink tequila, um, I know it's different than when I drink bourbon, you know, and the same with grappa. Mm -hmm. At least my head feels differently the next day. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's no doubt about it. I was burning through a couple of those mezcals two nights ago when my wife brought them home. And uh, the next morning, it was, I was a little cloudy. Cloudy with yeah. a chance of, uh, slight chance of hangover. It was, it was pretty good. <laughs> well, let, let's get to the next one here. This is mm. the uh, Wild Turkey. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Bottled and Bond. This is I'm about to draw my glass. This is their uh, their latest uh, limited edition, and it is on my uh, list for uh, American whiskeys of the year. So, this has got a strong chance of winning. All right, some good stuff. So, are you? Uh, do you have your Kentucky Colonelship? Have you received that? I'm sure you probably have. I am a Colonel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am as back. well. Right on. Mm -hmm. We've, uh, um, I'll be sure to tell them. Actually, I'm really close with them. Uh, I've, I've helped them raise some money and done some volunteer things. But uh, that's awesome. When did you become a colonel? Uh, 1999. In 99. That's awesome. Yeah, a, yeah, I'm somehow also connected to Hart County, Kentucky, which was one of the offshoots of my family. No way. Mm -hmm. A lot of moonshine there. Yeah, a lot of moonshine. I've never lived there. I've only driven through there. But my sister still lives, and uh, she owns a, a thoroughbred breeding farm in uh, Lexington. She's in Paris, Kentucky, which is right outside. Okay. So. A lot of uh, history in Paris, too. Tons. Yeah, that's, a, that's the thing about, you know, Kentucky. There's so much... Um, there's so much you know, history that goes back to the 1800s. Oh, yeah. And it's just, there's so many, so many cool stories I hear. So if you have a family that's got like a, you know, county named after them, that's awesome. You know, not a lot of people well, he's, say that. Yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they would have been cousins because I'm more from the John Hart line, which were the, uh, the Declaration of Independence side or John Hart. So we, we all kind of come from that side. And then my mother's side, where they're all Mayflower peoples, we're celebrating our 400th year this year of my family wow. being in the country. You're like, a, you're legit. I'm like a, we have no idea what I am. I'm just like a, I'm like a pound mutt, you know? Everybody's got mutt, man. That's why we're healthy. <laughs> and I was trying to explain this to somebody the other day. We were talking about the society and, and, Mayflower, and I was like, dude, you do realize, like, I'm no more American than the guy who just got his citizenship. Like, it's irrelevant. Yeah. That's what America is. That's what makes us amazing, is there is, is no, I am no more American than that guy. That's how it works, and that's why it works. I wish more people would take that, no, no pun intended, would take that to mm -hmm. heart, mm -hmm. because... Uh, you know, there's a there's a sense of superiority, you know, from from some um, about their culture being better. Yeah, than it's another's. not true. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Where I mean, our culture is a mix of cultures. That's what we are. I mean, when when my family got here, they they were run into for you know religious persecution. That's the only reason Plymouth was built. You know, it just so happened that it worked. Hmm. And, and then we become beautiful. a country because we become a country because um, some people didn't want to pay taxes. <laughs> and I can't blame them. No. <laughs> my, my, my family uh, um, had quite a few of my, my great, my, I guess, 11th, 12th, 9th generations who fought in that war. And I'm very grateful for it. Wow. Man, this smells great. But it's... It, I don't know what it is about wild turkey, man, but it's literally like, it's the cologne, you know exactly what it is. It always, it's like a signature smell every time I have it. We call it the wild turkey funk. Is that what it is? Huh. We call it the funk, yeah. All right, man, I get it. I can get with that te that terminology. Mm. 
I'm just realizing I'm look, I look like a, like a bush pilot. I look like I'm flying cocaine out of Miami. Look at the big headphones in my hat. Hey, man, if you were flying cocaine out of Miami, we'd mm-hmm. be having a very different conversation. We would be. Oh, man, that's Where's really my great. money? Where's my money, Emerson? Where's my money? <laughs> yeah. where's, where's my blow? Oh, dude. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? This is really great. So this is 17 years old. 17 years old it's the first um bottled and bond that wild turkey's released so this is Mm -hmm. like this is a historic bottle in many sense um very excited about this one yeah it sure is pretty but man it just has that wild turkey thing man Mm mm-hmm Hush. Mm. Wow. That is really good. Hey, hush. Quit. Phoebe, quit. You want to bark? Go outside. <laughs> Welcome to farm life, bro. <laughs> what kind of dog? Oh, she's just like a half German shepherd, half God knows what her mother got. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but yeah, you know, she's just a mutt, but she, she loves chasing deer and, um, she's really good in the field though. She never, you know, when I, I shoot a lot of trap and skeet around here cause we're, we sit in the middle of kind of a trust and they're developing mm-hmm. the end of it, but we're still kind of protected. So she'll sit down there with me and go to sleep and I'll, I'll, you know, blast it off four tens and. 12 gauges and over and under 28 and 12 and she doesn't doesn't flinch she's fine so she's definitely got something else in her well Mm. we're uh we're talking about getting another dog and you know my wife wanted to get uh she wanted to get a french bulldog i'm like when did you when when did you want to when did that happen? We've always been getting dogs from pounds and stuff. She's like, I just really want a French Bulldog. So she starts looking at French Bulldogs and like, holy shit, they're 12 grand. And yeah, I was dude, like, they ain't yeah. cheap. I mean, I, we're not getting that French Bulldog. So and they yeah. also, they, they can't breed. They're like, anatomically, you can't, they don't work that way. Yeah, like, it's like a shelf life whole, of eight years or something. Yeah, the whole thing. It's like buying a, an old Triumph Spitfire. It's great yeah. for like the first couple of years, and then the clutch burns out and all the wiring goes on it. You know, it's not good. <laughs> so, I mean, the conversations you have you have in marriage over stuff, it's just like this is one of them where it's like, where are you coming from? But hopefully she doesn't listen to this um this episode and i don't get in trouble for this so. i think you're gonna be fine you're gonna be fine <laughs> don't worry about it all right so what's your what's your verdict here on the on the turkey bottle to bond i think it's a really beautiful whiskey <clears throat> it does taste like a wild turkey so i gotta give him dap for that that's a real sign of a you know of a great company a great distiller and um, it's it's it it tastes safe to me, but still mature and, and beautiful. It's like right. the difference between a, a Napa Cab and a and a a great Bordeaux. They they should have the same notes, but the Bordeaux in general is going to taste more mature. Mm-hmm. I love yeah. a Napa Cab. Don't get me wrong. So I'm a kind of an old world guy uh, when it comes to wine, and you know some of those earthy notes that you would get, um, you know, from Burgundy. Um, mm-hmm. I have I found like in in some of Wild Turkey, and you know, I, you know, and there's some Rhones that I would describe that have like some dirt notes to them. Oh and, yeah. And I apply that same kind of like you know some of those same tasting notes to wild turkey mm-hmm. people perceive like dirt as like a bad note but really it's not it's uh it's just a real you know earthy you know undertone but 
But um, so where would you, how would you rank these? What is your, what is your pick um, for the whiskeys we've had? Man, I gotta, I gotta say, I think the Kentucky Owl might be my favorite. That is a really beautiful whiskey. Nice. Yeah, I think it's great. So I'd put Kentucky Owl, and it's kind of apples and oranges because of the rye thing. But uh, mm -hmm. I think the Old Fitzgerald is fantastic. The Wild Turkey is fantastic. But I would say, if we, were, if we had to, if somebody really put us under pressure to put the, the, the list together, I would say Kentucky Owl number one, Wild Turkey second, and then I would- uh, I Lost you there. Uh, I, do, uh, yeah. I, would, I would do a Kentucky Owl first. Okay. Then I would do the Wild Turkey second. Mm -hmm. And then I'm gonna put Old Fitzgerald and Peerless right at the back. That's exactly I how that's... I ranked him. Really? Exactly hmm. how I ranked him, yeah. Yeah, it's just, there's something so wonderful about that Kentucky Owl, man. I don't know what it is. It just, it's such a mouthful of all the stuff you need. It's like I said, just a little bit of the clove notes, uh, spice mm -hmm. to it. Um, but still has the, the bottom of a vanilla to make it like a great, uh, a great rice pudding. It's just like it just, it's got all the stuff in it, you know? Uh, so you're, um, you're, you're about to, you're about to go to dinner. You really mm -hmm. want to have this whiskey. What dinner are you choosing that you think would pair really well with this 11 year old batch one Kentucky Owl? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to say that if I was going to go to dinner and I was going to have uh, something a little bit more on the wild fare, if we're doing like uh, squab, if we're doing pheasant, um, some barbecued, mostly baked, I would do that. I would probably serve uh, fresh green beans with it. Also do a very, very heavy risotto to kind of back it up. I think all of those things would kind of mix in with that. It's just more of a wild fair whiskey to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would have that with a steak. If I was gonna have a steak, to be honest, I'd probably have the old Fitzgerald. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. you, you would be, you, you would pick the old Fitzgerald as your, as your whiskey of choice here for a steak. For a steak, yeah, I, I don't know why, yeah. because I feel like, I feel like the wild turkey has so, it's so specific I don't know if I would have that with dinner. I would have that after dinner, mm -hmm. you know, it and kind of let that, alone. it has okay. to stand alone. And that's my opinion. Um, but I could definitely pair that, that Kentucky owl with great venison, with great pheasant, uh, mm -hmm. even with, with maybe a trout dish. I don't think I would do it with salmon because I think it'd be too fatty, but, mm -hmm. but I would definitely do the trout. Awesome. Well, man, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I love what you're doing. I love your music. Um, I'm, I'm, I was so thrilled and tickled to find out you're a whiskey, a, a whiskey head. Uh, I, I am a whiskey head. But your passion's wine, right? Like you. That's true. That's where, where it kind of comes from. Yeah, my, my, my passion for alcohol definitely started with wine. Um, I learned about whiskey probably in my early 20s and kind of grew from there. I mean, my grandfather, who lived almost to 100, he always had... Uh, great old bottles of whiskey in his library and i'm not saying that i didn't as a young man maybe spend some time by the fire with my grandfather and sample some of these um, but they were just too strong and i didn't understand at that point <clears throat> so when i, I kind of moved to wine I, i've learned a lot about wine i'm just now starting to learn about italian wine which i'm completely ignorant about mm -hmm. and so i'm kind of expanding my palate there but you know, I still try to get to Kentucky once a year. My, a few buddies of mine will go up and we'll hit Willet and some of our other favorite places and kind of dig around and learn. So I'm, you know, it's a process. You know, I just try not to overdo it. You know, yeah. but wine I overdo. This is a this is definitely an issue. I buy a lot of wine. <laughs> well, it, it's easy to do. It's easy mm -hmm. to do. You can you can you can buy uh, you can buy a lot of wine. Um. And. It'll get you, you know. I today we just I just got back from the liquor store before we before I hopped on. This is why I was a little late. We were mm -hmm. we were stocking up for the weekend. I mean, I just kept putting stuff in the basket in the basket, and then I checked out. And I was like, oh, I guess five hundred dollars is what I'm spending today on uh, on tequila and bourbon. 
So it happens. It has. Fast. It happens fast, man. I've I've tried to. One of the real great things I'm sure about your job as well as my job is just I've been able to spend time with a lot of great fitness and make relationships with them and be like, what is, is this worth this? Is this worth this? And how does this taste? Is this too young? Like uh, every time I go to Napa, which is at least four times a year, um, I get to meet great people and be educated. Just like today, I'm learning from you. Like I, I love that. I, I love the shared community sense of bourbon, wine. Uh, I just love that. It's just, I love to learn, you know? And Have you spent what, any time at uh, Maynard's Winery? In uh, Arizona not. from Tool? I have not. He sent me um, a couple of great... Now, he's more of a Barolo guy. He's more of a Italian-Spanish um, mm -hmm. guy. Uh, we talked a little bit about Tempraneos, which was still is like wonderful. A great Tempraneo is, can change your life. It can make a lunch yeah. into a great dinner. Uh, mm -hmm. And Even though I tend to be more of a French guy. But, uh, yeah, he, he had one that was... It's a Barolo... Um, and I got to say, man, it was fantastic. It was absolutely fantastic. It was a great wine. I was like, Jesus, you grew this in Arizona? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's crazy to me. But when you think about it, sp dude, Spain is insanely dry in some sections. I mean, it's like yeah, a desert. Yeah, it's, it's, Arizona's a lot like Argentina, too. Exactly. Yeah, Mendoza, especially. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just think it's... I, I What I love about musicians um, and this is why I really I really try to find musicians um, you know to come on the show that talk whiskey with is because there's the taste uh, taste seems to be connected to creativity in like mm -hmm. you know this is this is genetic this is like you know also train but to be able to spot what you taste in, in some ways is the same way you're able to tap into your emotions to write a song. And mm -hmm. what I have found is, is that, you know, musical talent uh, almost are always great tasters because you're very reflective. And, and that's, I think that's amazing what, what Maynard's been able to apply as a, as an actual winemaker, you know, to some of his stuff. Cause it's, I mean, he's, he's putting Arizona wine on the map. So I know dude. I mean, and it's, he's a serious dude. Like I'm not real, you know, I'm not close with him. We have the same management and I've slowly gotten to know him a little bit, but dude, he is a serious guy and I love how serious he is. Cause he's also hilariously dry. Like his wit is, is fantastic. Yeah. He's, he's talented. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, that, that, uh, of course represented by shelter shelter also, you know, represents me, but I mean, you know, for whatever reason, they're like, you know, me. But uh, you know, there's you, Mick Fleetwood, Maynard, me. Mm -hmm. it, it makes no <laughs> sense, but I'll take. I know, it. I know. Hey, look, it's a big happy family, brother. It's a big happy yeah. family. <laughs> well, I, I've loved this conversation. It's not going to be uh, the last for sure. Uh, so just, you know, tell us what you're working on now. And, you know, what's something you you got coming down the pike that, you know, listeners can go check out? Um, you know, I just I released a solo album a couple months ago right before the pandemic. It was perfect timing on my part. Um, it's called 32,000 Days. Uh, it's kind of an homage to my stepfather who's 94, World War II vet, still alive, still healthy, still kicking ass. Um, and about our journey together. It's not a historical record, uh, but it's an interesting record. And, you know, just working on new tonic music, and uh, we'll probably release that when we can get back out up on the road. But, you know, I'm around. I look forward to that, man. I look forward to seeing tonic uh, on stage. Uh, I, I did see you all. I want to say, I want to say it was in Tulsa, uh, God, when I was in college, mm -hmm. like late 90s. I mean, not oh, that yeah, you we remember every one of your shows, but. Dude, there used to be a club, and it's not in Tulsa, but it was in Oklahoma City called Samurai Saki House. Yeah. And, man, it we used to roll in there starving because the guy who owned it, I forget what his name was, he's a very large Japanese fella, and uh, he would say, you sit! And we would sit down after, before we'd play, and he'd just load us up with 
probably more MSG than any human body should have, but at that <laughs> age, <laughs> you could take it. Um, and he would ply us with sake, and then we would, you know, play for two hours and then get in the van. This is before we had, you know, we're in a bus and uh, roll on to the next city. But man, I always think about it. we have had some unbelievably fantastic times in Oklahoma. And my sister yeah. is a, a grad too. She's at Stillwater there. All right, your sister and I have a lot in common. I'm an Oklahoma mm -hmm. State grad. Yep. Right, go folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Emerson, uh, take the take your favorite glass. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm actually out of the wilderness, or not the wild, the uh, the Kentucky Owl. So I'm uh, grabbing what I'm gonna, I have left here. Okay. Actually, gonna, no, I can pour a little bit more. Uh, don't don't waste do. it, buddy. <laughs> I'll, I'll enjoy this here. We'll, um, we'll sip to some new to when we see Tonic on stage again. Yes, sir. I say to that. And let me, let me, let me ask you this question real quick before we go. Um, okay. If you're at Hemingway's grave, what whiskey do you pour on his grave in Oxford, Mississippi? Uh, I would actually probably wouldn't do it. For Faulkner. Uh, well, for Faulkner... Um, Hmm. I think Fal Faulkner. I think there's some uh, recorded, uh, some recorded moments of him drinking Four Roses. Mm -hmm. I think I probably pour some Four Roses on him. Uh, in fact, hold on. Mm -hmm. Might even be this bottle right here. This is a this is a Four Roses from uh, the 1930s. Holy and, um, mother! It'd been a blend like this. Actually, I just. I just had this with an Dominican Sioux, so. Man, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah, this is this is a. By the way, it's a great whiskey too. So that's probably what I'd pour on his grave. Hmm. Hemingway, I'd, I'd I'd do a rum. Yeah, you know, a rum or a tequila. Probably a, a Cuban rum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then Mark Twain, you know, a barrel of whiskey of any type. I don't think it matters. He was a whiskey <laughs> man. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, sir, thank you for coming on. It was a pleasure. I look forward to uh, hanging out with you in person one day and yeah, uh, for a... drink it, drinking a bottle with you in, in, in the flesh. I would love that. Can't wait. Thanks for having me on your show. Sorry I looked like a helicopter pilot today. No, that's all right, man. <laughs> it's all good. You look great. Cheers. Cheers.